Father, we just want to thank you again for your goodness towards us. You are a good father. And that's why we continue to love you. And even the love that we bring to you is not our own. You ignited that love in our hearts by Jesus Christ. We appreciate you. We give you all the worship. We cannot come to a place like this to share your word without just honoring you. Because you are the Lord of the word. Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of man cannot be God's word. It is only the word that proceeds out of your mouth that can be your word. And that's why I put myself in my place. I'm just a horse. I bring you to the place of battle. The battle belongs to you, Lord Jesus. You are the one who holds the double-edged sword. And the double-edged sword can walk two ways. Please, go forth and walk on my brethren. Let the other age come for me to walk in my life. That together we will be blessed. That together we will know that you have, you have really appeared and met with us. Have your way, O God. Amen. Let your word have your way today. I can touch people's ears, but I cannot reach hearts. But you are the one that can pass through the air and break every, every stronghold and get to the heart. Just touch our hearts today. Amen. And glorify your name. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Very quickly, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking. I'm sorry that I don't have anything to share because we came too late. We can't begin to prepare that, but um, I wanted to talk about beyond the church walls, ministry in the marketplace. Um, Jesus talks so much about the marketplace, very much about the marketplace. In fact, the statistics, they are amazing. I can give you the, maybe I'll, I'll leave, I'll try to leave the statistics with Pastor. Most of the work he did was in the marketplace. Very few he did in the synagogues. And even in the book of Acts, most of the miracles, out of about 40 miracles, only one happened in the synagogue. Most of them happened in the marketplace. Most of his parables had marketplace context. So the God of the Bible is interested in the marketplace. And too many times, we forget that um, the church is a training base. It's a place where men are trained. The real place of the battle and of ministry. It's outside of this world. That's where we can, it's there, out there. And if we don't realize that, a lot of times we will continue to come and make, and the world is, and that's what the devil, the devil knows. And he tries to keep the church from knowing it. He tries to battle us out there and push us back to our walls that we feel only comfortable when we come back into the church walls. People are in the place of ministry and they look at it, they say, well, I, they can buffer me, buffet me right, left and center here. When I get back to church, I will feel good as we worship God. Any soldier that does that, that the barracks becomes the place that he loves being the most cannot do battle well for his country. Are we, are we together? Yes. yes. The place where soldiers are trained for is out there in the battlefield. And that's where God has been preparing us. Pastor has been preparing us there. And everything that comes from teachers, pastors, evangelists, and everybody is to build into us the capacity to be able to do what we need to do. Let me define the marketplace so that you can understand what I'm talking about. The marketplace is generally speaking the place where we each spend the bulk of our days and time with people we can influence, especially unbelievers. Are we together? That's the marketplace because when I say marketplace, the first thing that jumps into every mind is where I walk. No, it's beyond where you walk. It's where you can influence unbelievers, where you can influence people, even Christians. And many times you find out that it's not just here. More than 75% of our daily lives, even our Sundays, is spent in the marketplace. 
not in church. Do you know that if, <laughs> if you spend two more time here, and we, in fact, some people may be waiting to use this place now. Is that not so? And even if it is our own, do you know that by the time you begin to linger too much and too much, pastor will say, well, we have a home to go to. Because this is not home. It's a place where we train you and send you back into the marketplace so that you can be what God wants you to be in the marketplace of life. So that's where we spend most of our time, 75%. We spend less than 25% in the church. And what do we do in the marketplace? Commuting, buying stuff, <laughs> um, day job, mothering and fathering, chatting with friends, dropping kids off at school, supermarkets. Do you know that there are people you check out, you check out from in the, in the supermarkets? And you check out here, you check out there, you check out everywhere. That is a context for discipleship. Where I can decide that I want to, I want to try and check out from one person anytime I'm in the shop. And I can begin a conversation. I'm not preaching to the person, I'm having conversation. And as I check out, people talk. They talk football when they are checking out. And I can begin to talk some things. And I know where I stop. And then by the time I come to check out next, I know where we begin from. Are we together? And gradually I'm discipling somebody right there at his desk. Where is I'm the customer? <laughs> the customer they said is the king. Is that not so? <laughs> the Lord will help us. Those times we we don't take it as being something, but in the run of things of God, that's the eats for God. In fact, the early church, that was where they, they ministered. It was in the marketplace, everywhere. And Matthew 28, 19 and 20 in the ISV, you know, many times, many of the versions says, go and make disciples. But many people have said that what the disciples had when Jesus was speaking, what he actually was telling them was, as you go, make disciples. It turns evangelism totally all around. Are we together? It turns the Great Commission around. Because what we have always thought is that it's a program. You come and then everybody, two by two, go. Yes, there's a place for that. But the one that won the award for God was as you go, make disciples. Amen. And do you know that <laughs> one of the greatest, and that's why the, the church, we need to change our mindsets. One of the greatest principles of life is that we must go. You must. You see, sometimes I will tell people, I say, you will go. And they will say, amen. I said, I'm not praying for you. It's coined into your DNA. There's no way you will not go. If you stay here for longer than normal, pastor will say, yes, it's time to go home. Is that not so? You can't be in the house and you stay in your house day after day. If you stay two days in a row and you are not going out, Dad, what's happening? He said, what's happening? What? This is my house. He said, no, but you are not going out. <laughs> because everybody knows that it's a thing that God has coined into the DNA of man, that he must keep going. He must keep moving. Everybody looks for the opportunity to hit the door and go out there. Now, the issue is that since you have to keep going, and God made it impossible for you not to go. If you refuse to go from here, two people will come and say to your case, either they call the hospital to say, we have a couple of people here, we don't know what's wrong with them, they are not going, they are not doing what is normal. And we need our help for something else. Or <laughs> they will call the police. Are we together? I'm just trying to paint a picture. And I believe from the look of your eyes, you get the picture. Huh? <laughs> Amen. So, the issue now is not that you will go. Whether you like it or not, you will keep going. But the real issue now is what do you do as you go? The going of some people is as useless as not going at all for the kingdom. Because they don't do anything. In fact, some people's going 
damage the gospel. Because their life is not backing the gospel up. And the gospel doesn't have, you see, today people think that the gospel is not powerful. And yet, Romans 1, 1 17 says the gospel is the power of Amen. God unto salvation. Amen. And it has not changed. What has robbed the gospel, seemed to rob the gospel of its power, is the life of the Christian. Because the gospel thrives on two things simultaneously the witness of life and the proclamation of the mouth. They too, let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, let them be. The witness of the mouth must go hand in hand with. Because when Jesus, when you go and I begin to preach to this man, you are not a non believer, but imagine. And I begin to preach to him. One thing the Holy Ghost begins to do is, is speaking through me to this man, to this uh, is my brother, Amen. to this person. And then the same Holy Spirit is working with him and telling him what that man is saying is correct, is true. I can save you. I want to do something new in your life. And do you know what the Holy, the man will ask for proof. He won't tell you that he's asking for proof. But right there in his heart he's saying, <coughs> It's not possible. This thing is saying it's not, it, it, it doesn't happen. And all the Holy Spirit begins to look for is to get a witness. And that's why he said, he did not say in Acts 1 8 that go and do witnessing for me. It's not a doing. He said, go and be a witness. He's looking for people who he can look for when a man is asking for a proof within his context. And he says, look at Jane there. I made that life what it is. But if Jane's life is not something to go about, he said, ah, if that is the kind of life you give, sorry, I don't want it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the first thing the Holy Ghost is looking for are witnesses, men and women who can stand and say, look, if you, if you don't, if what I'm telling you about Jesus, you don't find it in my life, then know that it can't help you. It's a, it's, it, it, looks, it looks a far cry, but honestly, people will not believe what they don't see. They don't read the Bible, but they read people. Yes. They want to read your life. You are the Bible that people can read Amen. to come into the kingdom. It's very important. And the thing you can do as you go is to enable the discipleship process. How do you do that? I call it the straw principle. Because as we go in different environments and in different contexts where God sends us to, we apply what I call the 3D, um, DCC 3D principle. DCC is my church, my home church, Dudley Community Church in, in, in UK. Now, the 3D principle that we apply is number one, developing relationship. As you go, developing relationship. You cannot preach the gospel effectively to a person that you don't have a relationship with. The, the gospel thrives on relationship grounds. And I keep talking, I keep talking. In fact, thank God God is using my, my, my trait very well. I'm a total... I'm a total, what do they call it? Extrovert. <laughs> I keep talking on my feet everywhere I am. I mean, you can't meet me at the bus stop and I'm not talking to you. And I'm not talking gospel. But in my mind, I'm looking for how do we get this to that point. I've met people I was sharing in church today that I met at the bus stop. One lady. And the lady was complaining about the weather because it was raining. What a horrible weather. I said, ah, this thing you are calling horrible. To the farmers, they are rejoicing. God knows how to give the farmer everybody what they need. And I said, in about four months now, or five months, you two will be rejoicing over this rain that God has given you. She looked at me puzzled. I said, because you will go to the supermarket to buy what the farmer has. <laughs> Just five minutes before the boss came, I had presented God as a good God and as a wise God that does his work. 
I met a young man at the bus stop just like that too. He was wearing, when you look at the way he dressed, he looks like a soldier. And he came into the bus stop really proud of himself. And I said, wow, you look like a soldier. And all his bosoms began to creak. Yes, I want to be a soldier. I said, wow, that he just finished secondary school. He's waiting for the short list. I said, that's wonderful. In just about three minutes, he was hearing about the army of Jesus and Satan. And you know who won the battle? <laughs> I didn't push it beyond that, but I gave him enough information for him to know that there's a battle really going on in the world today. And you need to be on the right side. So, all God is looking for are people who will be able to develop relationships and they go. And anybody can develop relationships. You don't need to be a talker like me. My wife is a total, we are two opposite ends. She's a total, what do they call her? Introvert. But we've pulled one another to the middle now. <laughs> she, she talks even a lot more than me now when it has to do with the gospel. <laughs> she does that. So keep developing relationship. Anywhere you find people, just talk. Start with normal mundane things. Talk football. I've talked to people about football and met somebody and I said, wow, wow, wow. We were talking about the football match between my country, Nigeria, and another country. The moment I mentioned, he said, oh, look at what they did to us and all that. We lost that match. And as we were talking, oh, yeah, these people, and before he knew what was happening, the football match between Nigeria and that country turned to the football match between Jesus 11 and Satan 11. <laughs> <laughs> and before I turned, and he turned to his way, he had had the simple gospel, true football. So we just need to, to allow, to develop that mindset as we develop relationship to know how to keep just keep conversations going it doesn't have to be spiritual in fact if you start with spiritual people will shut you down begin somewhere else and then discover stories that's the second d number one develop what relationship number two as you as you develop relationship begin to discover stories in fact, it's better to tell your own story first. As you tell your own story, you have made yourself vulnerable. People will share their stories too. And, as, and I've learned to share my story in a way that I will, I will tell the person what I used to be, where I am now, but do you know what made the difference? Do you want me to tell you what made the difference? Because it, I was a terrible person at this point, but look at where I am now. And he said, yeah, that, that would be great to know. And then I tell them about how the gospel changed my life. Mm -hmm. He invited it. I didn't tell him that, but I just told him that my life changed. Are we together? Discover people's stories and tell your own stories. And finally, design the Kairos moment. God will always create Kairos moments. One thing that I know about God he said, look, my father is always at work, and I am always working too. He's always working in life. I know people that will say, ah, that man, he's like, he, he, in fact, in this place, there's nothing called the gospel. These people are going on their way to hell. Nalai. Sorry. Sorry, my, in my country, they will say Nalai. But Nalai means he's a lie. <laughs> it's not true. God is at work there. No matter how dark the place is, God is at work. No matter how dark a life is, God is at work there. But you may not know it until you begin to relate with the person. Then as the person begins to talk and begins to share stories, you say, oh, so this is where God is working. And then you can leverage on what God has been doing in that life to be able to bring him into the matter. Are we together? So three days, don't forget. I will send this to you, sir, through him. And then always drop a straw, please, anywhere you go. That was what the early church did. In fact, many people thought that the, the early church, that the, the, the reason why, why they were chased out of Jerusalem, in fact, many people are due to the fact that 
It was because the Holy Spirit raised persecution against them. No, he didn't raise persecution against them. It was because they were doing what Jesus told them to do. As you go, eh? as you go, preach this gospel. And as they went in the street, at their places of work, where they are doing leather work, where they are doing, they are talking about Jesus. And on the street, you can't pass, you can't walk along a long street and not hear the gospel from about 10 people. So it was, and that's what the gospel does. Once it begins to call in that intensity in a place, there will be a reaction. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Yes. That was why Jesus said that, look, there will be persecution. It will always come. Especially when we are doing the right thing that Jesus, Jesus told us to do. The world doesn't want to hear it. The master of the world doesn't want to hear it. But as we begin to preach it, there will be, there will be a reaction. And that was what the reaction was. But Jesus had prepared them well. And the disciples prepared them well. They were not wasting their time in Jerusalem. All the time they were, they were preparing those brethren. So that when the persecution came, what happened? Seeds were scattered. And everywhere those seeds landed, what happened? Hey, here I see. They began to bring fruits out. And that's what the church, that's what this, this is a seedbed. Where God is preparing men and women to be able to <laughs> disciple and have churches. Do you know in your in your in your place of work you can have a church there? It looks impossible now, but it's possible. You you when you have one person that joins you as you begin to gradually let your light shine, the moment one person joins you, you have a church where two or three are gathered. Amen. And as you begin to pray, gradually you grow there. You don't. It doesn't need to be in your face before you have a church. The underground church is growing there and they are doing what you have done to them as you keep discipling them to do the same thing. Amen. So, the missionary mandates today, brethren, don't be afraid because when you say the missionary, they said, I hope he's not sending us to Afghanistan. No. <laughs> but there's always a missionary mandate. The first battleground of life, uh, uh, of of the gospel was in the marketplace. And I believe very much that this arena of the marketplace is going to be the last battleground. And that's why, do you know what is happening now? God is turning missiology upside down. He's turning missional engagement upside down. The people that we used to go and look for, we pay the price to fly to their countries. We pay the price to, to learn their language and learn their culture, to be able to preach to them. And they will persecute you and tell you if you speak to our people, we send you out or we finish you. Now, God, <laughs> God is scattering them from their countries. They are coming into our own countries. And they are, they are the one paying the price to learn the language so that they can find a job. They are the one learning the culture so that you can be on par with them. We should use that. Amen. We should leverage on what God has done for us. Amen. It must not waste. And that's why I should go, honestly, take the discipleship process out of the church setting. It's not just believers class that is discipleship. When you meet a person out there, begin to think missionally. That this person, I can begin with, I see this person every day. I drop my children at school every day, and as I get to the place, there's this young woman that comes to drop her children or comes to pick her children. We could strike a conversation and become friends. And gradually, things will progress from there. You see, if we don't put that missionary mindset, heart on, we will miss most of the opportunities God creates, and is always creating those opportunities all around us. The Lord will help us. So, as you go, it takes engagement away. When you begin to win souls and disciple them in the marketplace, you don't need to bring them into the church to say, we will have believers class for you. Uh, what do they call those classes? Sunday school. Uh, uh, 
you can disciple the man right in his context and bring him to church when he has found his feet so that you don't bring him cold turkey as a fish out of water into the church and then he just if it's not numbers we are just looking for to count that is the best way to go about it disciple him in his content do you know what that does for him it helps him to live victoriously amongst his people you are not blocking him from good time with his family he becomes a model of the christ life amongst his people as he learns to live for christ he learns to contextualize his own gospel to them because he knows his family more than you know them the best person to preach to a family is the member of that family in my family we have about 10 10 10 children 11 but 10 then um, one and two has gone to be with the lord and then in my wife's family they say it started with us both of us were the first people to get born again but we never ran away from our families in fact we lived with them and they saw the christ life they saw the dramatic change that happened in their life they began to ask questions we never preached to, to most of them more than once maximum twice but they saw the witness of life all of them are born again today Amen. not because we struggled but because we lived right amongst them to showcase christ so let, they learn to contextualize their gospel to their family they keep family friends family and friendship lines it's active you don't cut them away from their family and then the family just looks at them you are now christians don't come and talk to us but they are there growing in the midst of their people are we together the Lord will help us. So, that's how we can labor like the first church. I think, I don't want to push it. Can I stop here? I should push it. Okay. So, <laughs> the issue now in these end times is that the church should be more proactive in strategic training, equipping and retraining and refocusing the ability of brethren so that we can exact tangible, positive influence in the seven mountains of influence. You know what those mountains are? Who knows? The mountains of influence. Yes, sir. Can you enumerate them, sir, quickly? Uh, education, health. Um, I know them, but I just can't think of Okay, them. don't worry. Oh, but I do know them. Sorry, I, I do. I understand you know it. But... Yeah, Lance Warner, but he was, he was the uh, guy. Yeah. Thank you very much. They are the religious mountain, the family, thank you, the education, government, media, art, and business. Those are the seven. They are, that's, and do you know that's where all these people that are against the gospel are targeting? And they take hold of those mountains, and we Christians will pull back. We forget that that's the arena where we can showcase Christ. But once they flood that place, we retreat. And we have been retreating into our churches more and more. We need to begin to, to go out again, gradually. And you see, we need to be the best in those mountains of influence. The one we have taken is the religious. We have been there so much. Sometimes even family, we have not been able to take it so much. Education, they are taking it away from us. Government, media, arts, business. Who says a Christian cannot be the best they can be in the media and be the best professional there? The thing is, if, if, if all I can do there is to, is to do a shoddy job and I think that, well, I'll put my whole time in church things, and I, I sneak in there, I just do a shoddy job. I am not showcasing Christ. I need to be the best I can be in my profession. There was a story that was told of one man. He's um, an executive in one of the biggest, um, he's in America. I read this story. This man is a BAM person, BAM missionary, business as mission. He was in this organization. It doesn't belong to him, but one of his um, people made a mistake, a girl, a lady, 
in the financial market made a mistake that cost the company about hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not some millions. And this girl broke down and was crying. She no money. It's a cutthroat market, that place. You do that, you are gone. In fact, you pay everything that you went to talk to this boss and was weeping. And the boss said, it's okay. And tried to comfort her and say, well, we all can make a mistake. That no problem. Let's look for how to recoup it. And gradually began to build back up. This lady asked him, he said, what, what? Why would you do this kind of thing in this kind of place? Anybody will fire me. Why are you firing, not firing me? He said, I can't because I made more mistakes than you. And God forgive me. So why can't I forgive you? She gave her life. Right there. Amen. Because somebody showed grace in the place of work. So God is at work in all these seven mountains. And we must realize it that he can use us in those places. This is where you are already working. You have been trained to be there. Then be there for God. Irrespective of the new social order, it doesn't matter. Do you know that the early church was operating in as difficult a time as we are in today? Because Caesar was the Lord, and you are now standing to say Jesus was the Lord. It was death. And they took their lives in their hands. Many of them were thrown into lions. They died. And yet, the remaining brethren continued to say Jesus was the Lord, not Caesar. So, if we say it's more difficult now than then, no, it's not, it's, not, it's not like that. It's not true. But the body are witness to the point where the Bible said that they were able to go through the whole world of their time and preach the gospel as a witness. That was why all of them were so sure that Jesus would come in their time. They finished the work in that area. In, that, in the world they knew, they didn't know that there were other worlds. If, if God had capped heaven, I mean, the, the, the thing that time, I don't know where we would have been because the gospel had never got into us at that time. Even to Europe, no. Can we begin to better prepare our people so that we can take the gospel toolbox along with the work toolbox? There are ways in which you can preach to people in the place of work and they won't know that you have preached to them. Do you understand? You have preached and the person doesn't even know you have preached to them because but it's when the Holy Spirit, because it's, you understand that you can't you can, you can win him. The thing that put pressures on us is that we think that we are the ones that are doing the winning. No, it's the Holy Spirit. You can't. All God expects you to do is give information to this person. And as long as you give the information, honestly, you've done your work. The Holy Spirit will finish the rest. So, no pressure. I don't need to be to feel that um, um, I have not, um, I've not done something and, I, and then I begin to feel guilty. No. So let's, God will help us to be able to prepare our people with both the gospel toolbox and the work toolbox so that they can go together. The, the work toolbox, their office is providing that. The church needs to prepare. That's why I'm looking at them. The church <laughs> needs to prepare the toolbox. The, the gospel toolbox that will be helpful to you and me to be able to preach this gospel wherever we go. Can we help them to acquire relationship skills for this task in the marketplace and then try to help them with cross-cultural training? Because sometimes you can meet a person and you are preaching from the background of your culture, the gospel and you find out that you are not connected. Because what you are saying is not sinking in. We need to know how that person receives what you are giving them. We need to learn how to listen to people. You see, the gospel is not a one-way street. It's a conversation. 
you need to hear back from people the feedback and that helps you to be able to know what to say next. If you don't know where the person is, you'll be telling him information that he already knows and you'll be wasting his time. And he will say, I know that. So what next? What's new? And you can speak above the person's head without him knowing A. You're already telling him Z. You, you, you ruin it. But when you get a feedback from the person, you know where the person can be, you try to gauge him and get him pinned to a place, then you begin where he has already got into, and then you journey with him from that point forward. It becomes easy, it's like pouring water through a watering can rather than a hose. Are we together? The Lord will help us.